Well, we want to welcome everyone this morning. It's good to see a few more people here, even than we had last week, I think. And uh, we are glad for some of the relaxed restrictions here in Kansas City that have enabled us to have uh, 50% capacity. And uh, we do want to welcome those who are watching us on the live stream today as we are doing both again for the, the second week in a row. And uh, we will be communicating to you exactly what's going on over the next few weeks as we are back in the building and we understand why some are not yet willing to come back uh, for safety reasons. So uh, we honor that and respect that. Uh, but uh, we will be opening up uh, in the weeks ahead. Uh, so uh, keep that in mind. Don't forget, uh, we still have the Sunday school class being taught on Zoom at nine o'clock, and we also have uh, those in the fellowship hall during that time as well. And then 1015, the live service and the live stream here. Uh, Missions Monday is still on Mondays, and Wednesday, don't forget the virtual prayer meeting as well as we are also meeting in the fellowship hall. And uh, we are spending all of our time on Wednesday nights in prayer over there. So. Um, we are devoting at least an hour just to do nothing but pray for the church, pray for our nation, pray for our missionaries. So we encourage you to join us uh, either by WhatsApp on Wednesday nights or there in the fellowship hall. Friday Blessings is still going on on Facebook, so take note of that, the private Facebook page. And we have been sending out the announcements each week, so be sure and take a look at those. If you do not have access to the internet or email, we do have some of the information there on the table in the foyer. So go ahead and pick that up. And we do have some prayer requests there. We have some prayer sheets back there. We'll be coming out with our new missionary sheet this week. And also the giving options are right here in the uh, the announcements as well that you can take a look at when you receive those and also the totals. Um, we're delighted today to have David and Amy Ice here today and we know to whom they're related, uh, Tommy and Janice and uh, uh, we just thank you uh, Lord for um, the opportunity as we've been praying for Tommy and Janice this week and uh, their family, just continue to pray for them um, in the loss of his mother. It's also good to have Nathan with us today. We want to welcome you back, Nathan. And uh, if you do have any questions at all, um, don't forget, uh, you, can, you can ask. And also, when we're leaving today, we're still following the same rules that we've had, the same guidelines. I like to call them rules, some guidelines that we can follow uh, just to, to keep everybody safe. Um, don't forget, you can wear masks also, so that's also in those guidelines. So uh, we are so glad to see each of you here today as we worship the Lord. What a great God we serve who has made a wonderful creation which we get to enjoy and it should point us to him, and that's what we're singing about this morning. Uh, the first song for the beauty of the earth. All of the, the lyrics for our songs will be on the screen, as well as those that are in the hymnal will say that. We're starting with number 36, for the beauty of the earth, followed by I worship you, Almighty God. <laughs> Sorry. 
verse 4. For the joy of human love, brother, sister, parent, child, friends on earth and friends above, for all gentle thoughts and mild. Lord of all, to Thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. I worship You, Almighty God. There is none like You. I worship You, O Prince of Peace. That is what I want to do. I give you praise, for you are my righteousness. I worship you, Almighty God. There is none like you. Let's sing that again. I worship you, Almighty God. There is none like you. I worship you, O Prince of Peace. That is what I want to do. I give you praise, for you are my righteousness. I worship you, Almighty God. There is none like you. Amen. God, we're so thankful that we can come to you in prayer. We recognize that you are worthy of all praise and honor and glory. And we are so thankful that we can have this privilege of coming before you in prayer and know that you not only hear our prayers, but that you are willing to answer them. And we ask you to minister to us during this hour, help us to love you and serve you. There are many in our congregation and around uh, the area that need our prayers consistently. We want to pray for those who have recently lost loved ones because we know that even though death is, uh, is something we cannot comprehend, yet we are quite sure of the fact that, that you are there and that you are able to minister to those who have lost loved ones. We pray for Ron and the loss of his father. We pray for Joe and the loss of his niece. And I pray for Lynn and the loss of her mother and for Patricia and the loss of her husband. And we're thankful for each of these, but we know that it's not just the family that suffers, but all of us that know these people uh, are, are very sensitive to their needs as well. And then I want to pray for those who are suffering from cancer, that dreaded disease that seems to control so much, but we pray that you would touch the hearts of those who are suffering in this way, and that you would give wisdom and direction for the doctors to be able to help them through this difficult period of time. Pray for Alan. We thank you for him. We know that you love him and that you are working in his life. We pray for Sharon's brother, that you would minister to him, that he might realize that you are indeed able to meet every need. And I pray for Tom, we thank you for him, that you would help him during this period as well. And for Laura's sister, who has been experiencing this difficulty with cancer. And so I pray for her. We pray for Annette, and we thank you that she is willing to let you direct in her life. We pray for Jason's father. We thank you that you are touching his life uh, and that you are able to minister to his needs as well, even during the, the breathing problems. But we have an additional prayer. We want to pray for all of those who are impacted by the COVID-19 
uh, disease. And we thank you that things are beginning to lighten up. We thank you that we can come to church now regularly. And we pray that soon we will see the end of this destructive disease here in our area. Also want to pray for those who recently had newborn babies who are experiencing some complications. I pray for Emmeline, that you would help her in this period of time to develop properly. And I pray for Quentin, that you would help him in this situation. And then we also want to pray for Becca's due time because she is, was expecting to have her baby in the month of May. We just pray that you would enable her to have a good delivery. And so we just want to thank you for what you are doing in her life. And then finally, we want to pray for the financial provision for our church and our missionaries. We thank you for their service and we pray that your will might be done in their lives. And so we thank you and we want to express our thanks in this way. For I pray in Jesus' name, amen. And now I want to read a passage of scripture. It's found in Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 13. Some of these verses are probably well known to you, but if you'd like to turn to it, Philippians 4, verses 10 through 13. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross, says Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid, here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. And bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, Christ's curse has lost its grip in me. For I am his, and he is mine, fought with the precious blood of Christ. That we give thanks. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks, Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ His Son. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ His Son. And now let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich because of what? The Lord has done for us. And now let the weak say, 
say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich because of what the Lord has done for us. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ His Son. Give thanks. Give thanks. Thank you for your singing. You may be seated. Well, it seems like it's been a, a very different time since March. You know, we look and we see how our country has been suffering, so has the rest of the world with the outbreak of the virus. Uh, not only have hundreds of thousands contracted it, and some die, and many have died, the crisis also has disrupted, of course, our public assemblies and social gatherings and wreaked economic havoc on our nation. Well, now in the past week, our nation has also been rocked by protests all across the nation. And as we pull it up, we see city after city after city affected. Now, whether we agree or not with the issue that's been the source of the problem, the protests have accelerated and exploded out of control. And these follow other protests that we saw earlier than that, protesting the lockdown right here in our own country in many, many states. Many cities in our own country are experiencing unrest and discontentment. I saw similar unrest in Oaxaca, Mexico, though over a different issue when I was down there in November, when I visited with David and Karina Lopez and and the church family there in, in uh, Santa Maria Coyotepec. And in that little town, which is, it's not a little town, but it's a suburb of the large town, large city of Oaxaca, there was unrest. And you saw the pictures, probably, of David and me riding through the streets, riding through five different blockades there on the highway. And as I passed through those, I saw... Uh, the unrest when I was there about 15 years before that, there was unrest. And it was all around the teachers' union. But David said this time there were other radical groups that had formed with the teachers' union and were blocking the highway and keeping people from going through. And it was there that I saw unrest and discontentment. Whether it be in our own country in Mexico, or many other countries in the world, contentment is something that is foreign to the lives of so many people today. And discontentment has even permeated the Christian community. Many times we're not satisfied with what we have. We must have more, we must have bigger, we must have better. And once the newness wears off of an item, we're ready for the new model. We've got to keep up with the Joneses, as the saying goes. As we look around and see what all our neighbors and our friends have, and, and we live in America and we think we have to have exactly what they have. We don't have as nice a car. We don't have as many luxuries. Our church is not as big as that particular church. And we go on and on with the comparisons. And before we know it, we, even as Christians, have fallen into the trap of discontentment. Our lives are too often characterized 
by covetousness rather than contentment. And of course, we know what the Word of God says. The Word of God talks about contentment. The Word of God says that no matter what our circumstances are, no matter what we have, there has got to be that trust in Him. There has got to be that relationship with Him and that contentment in Him. And this morning, we're going to continue the series that I started back in March on handling your problems. And we've been looking at many different issues that believers face. And today we're looking at discontentment. How do we deal with this problem of discontentment in our lives? Well, first of all, I want us to examine the realm of discontentment. And because there's there's two different aspects of discontentment that we need to look at. Now, when you look at it in the dictionary, Webster's Dictionary, you get this definition. It's a lack of satisfaction with one's possessions, status, or situation. A lack of satisfaction or a dissatisfaction with one's possession, status, or situation. It's a state of dissatisfaction and restless yearning. Think about that idea of restlessness. Restlessness, unrest, dissatisfaction. It all falls into the realm of discontentment. Now, there is an ungodly discontentment. I want to draw a distinction here between, and I I hope I'm, I'm not trying to cut too fine a line, but I think there is what I'm calling an ungodly discontentment, but there's also what I call a godly discontentment. Because let's remember that contentment is not complacency. And many people have fallen into that realm of being totally complacent when they ought to be discontented about where they are, especially where they are spiritually. But discontentment, what do I mean by ungodly discontentment? Well, it can hit us in a number of areas. And we're going to look at a few passages this morning, a few of the key passages on contentment. Um, I think it can attack us in, in four major areas. And you could probably come up with a list of more. But first of all, from 1 Timothy chapter 6, It attacks us in the area of material possessions. 1 Timothy chapter 6. This is a a key passage. Paul's dealing in the first part of chapter 6 with false teachers, as he does throughout 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy and Titus, as he's he's teaching this young, young preacher Timothy, overseer there in the church at Ephesus. He is teaching him to watch out for false teaching. And he talks about the false teachers, and he talks about them as having a motivation, and that motivation is wealth. That motivation is prosperity. Because he says in verse 5, they suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such withdraw yourself. And then he moves from there and talks about what godliness really is, and how godliness is so closely related to contentment. And we're going to look at this passage in a little more detail later. But you see the idea of contentment mentioned there in verse 6. Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, it's certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. And then in verse 9, verse 10, he moves into the area of discontentment. And I I have come to believe that the opposite of contentment is not just discontentment, it's covetousness. It's greed. And that's what he talks about in verse 9 when he says, those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts. Verse 10, he talks about the love of money. Not money itself, but love of money being the root of all kinds of evil. So this thing of discontentment can hit us in the area of material possessions. We're not satisfied with what we own. We've got to always have a nicer car. We've got to always have a bigger house. We've got to always have the latest fashion. And I'm not not saying that God wants you to always drive what I used to drive. 
my Sunfire is about ready to fall apart, but it passed inspection, it's still running, and it's a spare car. If anybody wants to borrow it, you can borrow it. That's what I kept it for. It's a loaner. If I need it, yeah, I can do it if mine's in the shop, but it's there. But I'm not saying that everybody has to have one in the 1990s or a 2002. You don't have to if God sees fit to give it to you. But don't make that your driving force. And that's what we see here. We can get in the area of material possessions into a state of discontentment. But then also, what about our circumstances? That's another area in which discontentment hits us. And that passage was read by, by Mr. Hull just a little earlier in Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. As Paul talks about the concern that the church at Philippi had for him and how they had given to him and met his needs throughout the years. He said, I rejoiced in the Lord, in verse 10, greatly that now at the last your care of me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am there with to be content. The word content comes up again. And this time, it's not dealing necessarily just with the financial, the material, though it's, it's alluded to in this passage, but just circumstances. Sometimes we are not happy with the circumstances in which we're in. And Paul says, I've learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased at the very bottom, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I've learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Discontentment can come upon us in the area of our personal circumstances, our place of residence, our place of employment, our marital status, our health condition. We're not satisfied with where God has placed us. And let's face it, sometimes those are difficult places. And sometimes we wish we could get out of that time of sickness. And it's not wrong to pray, God, would you please move me out of here? Because that's what Paul prayed. He prayed three times that the thorn in the flesh would be taken from him. But God saw fit to keep him where he was. And therefore, Paul became content there. Because he said, your grace is sufficient for me, as the Lord Jesus told him. He saw that. But there are times when we complain and we cry out for change because our circumstances are not the way we want them to be. We move into a third area. It can happen in the area of interpersonal relationships. And I threw in here an example that may not be a good example of that, and that's Paul and Barnabas. There was discontentment there. There was discontentment with whether John Mark should go on the second missionary journey. And honestly, I can see both sides of the issue. And I'm not ready to come down and criticize Paul or Barnabas and say that they were wrong, but they came to a point of conflict and they actually separated as a result and took two different teams. Sometimes discontentment can strike us in the area of our relationships. We're not satisfied with our spouse. We're not satisfied with our boss. We're not satisfied with our coworkers. We're not satisfied with our friends, so we disassociate with them and pick somebody else. It can also affect us in the area of spiritual ministry. And I think of John the Baptist's disciples in John chapter 3 and how they went to John and they said, John, look at Jesus. The whole world is following him. They didn't say the whole world, but I think in their minds they were thinking that. Look, he's becoming more popular than you are, John. And there became that envy, perhaps, and that jealousy. And John said, listen, my whole goal is to exalt him. He must increase, but I must decrease. That's the ministry that God's given to, to me. And in the area of spiritual ministry, sometimes we can become discontented. 
maybe the place where God's put us, or even the results of that service, just like John's disciples. We're losing people to Jesus. Well, what a, what a greater thing could happen. <laughs> but we become discontented. We wish we were serving in another capacity. We wish we were reaping greater results. I remember back 20 years ago, in 2000, when I became very discontented in my ministry. And I was wondering why things seemed to be drying up. And I did a series of messages on lessons from the desert. And I have to admit that those messages were not for you. <laughs> they were, but they were for me. I needed to hear those. And one day I was speaking right here to Calvary, and they, the chapel was, used to meet in here, and Dr. Lo Les Loftquist was here, and he heard the message, and he said, would you put that in an article form, and we'll put it in the Voice magazine? And they put it in a couple times. But I have to admit that that was for me, because I was going through a real dry time in my ministry, and I was looking at results, and the results weren't coming like I thought they should be coming. And I needed to learn the lesson of contentment. And there are times when I still need to do that. Even in the area of spiritual ministry, we can come to that point of discontentment. Now, some of you are saying, okay, is discontentment always wrong? I said there's a godly discontentment which should be pursued. And I don't find the word contentment or discontentment used with this concept. But I, I think in Philippians chapter 3... You cannot tell me that Paul was totally content with where he was spiritually. Because he says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 12, Not that I have already attained or have already perfected, but I press on. He said, I've not yet reached the finish line. I've not yet laid hold of the crown. I have not yet come to that point of total spiritual maturity. Now let me ask you a question. Have any of you come to that point? I don't see any hands going up. If so, we'll talk afterwards today. Because I want to know what your secret is. Because let's face it, Paul said the same thing. I haven't yet arrived. I haven't reached the finish line. None of us have come to that point of spiritual maturity. None of us are without sin. So as a result... I can't reach that place of complacency in my Christian life, saying, I've reached a certain level, I don't have to go any further. That's what I mean by discontentment. There's a godly discontentment which runs against complacency in the Christian life. We've got to always have that. It can motivate us to greater spiritual growth, and that's what Paul said. He said, I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. See, we can sit back on our laurels and we can, we can come to that place where we are complacent because of all the victories that happened in our lives in the past spiritually. And we can live on those. Maybe there was a time when we were more zealous for Christ than we are now. And we can use that as an excuse. Well, I've already been through that. I've, I've, I've served the Lord. What are you doing now spiritually? You know, I, I used to read God's Word so much, and now I don't have time to do it anymore. Well, we're living on victories in the past. And Paul said, no. He said, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things, the failures as well as the spiritual successes, and reaching forth to the things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. It can be a means. This thing that I call godly discontentment, and I don't know anybody else that stated it that way, so... Uh, but. It, it can motivate us to greater spiritual growth. It can also be a means by which God leads us. God has a way of closing doors. And God has a way of opening doors. God has a way of using a certain discontentment in our lives to move us on. 
Just because you are discontented about a particular job doesn't necessarily mean that it's sin. It could be if it's self-motivated. But there are times when God puts, I think, in our hearts a desire to move on. That he's saying, I want you to move on to something. I have know of men here in the church in the past who were not content fully with the jobs they had. One was in plumbing. One was in carpet laying. But they had a desire to go into ministry. And God led them into ministry and both became pastors. Because they came to that point where there was a certain unrest and a certain discontentment by which God moved them on to minister somewhere else. God has a way of doing that. There's a difference between that kind of discontentment in which God is leading us and the other kind of discontentment in which we want what we want and we're not satisfied where God's placed us. Now, which is it? Sometimes it's a fine line, and we need to look to the Lord. Today we're going to deal with that discontentment that we see so often in Scripture that is an ungodly discontentment. What is the root of this discontentment? What causes it? You know, the fruit we see so clearly. But what's the root? You have to get down to the root and say, what's causing this discontentment? And right now in your life as a believer, if you've come to that point where you're just not satisfied with where God's placed you, with what God's given you, with where you are right now, whether it be in your circumstances, whether it be in your, with your possessions, whether it be in your relationships, whether it be in your ministry. Everything seems to be, you come to that, that wall and you say, I'm not happy wherever I am. It's not, you know, we, we, we think that it's just as easy as just changing circumstances. And that's what people do so often. We see it in America in regard to marriage, where someone says, I'm not happy with this wife, so I'll move on to another one. We see people going through one job after another, many times because they are never satisfied with what they had. And this thing of discontentment can take us over. What's at the root of it? 1 Timothy chapter 6, we saw it there. As Paul said to the believers, to Timothy, and this is for believers, all believers as well. He says in verse 8, having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root a root of all kinds of evil. Covetousness and greed. The desire to have more and more and more, never satisfied with what we have. You know, if there's, if there's one person that knew what it was to have a great amount of wealth... You would have to agree it was John D. Rockefeller, Sr. He was once asked the question, how much money does it take to satisfy a man? And I'm sure you've heard his answer has been given many times in the past. Just a little bit more than he has, which means that money is powerless to satisfy those who waste their lives acquiring and hoarding it. And I, I, I'm not sure, it looks like he admitted that, at least in that particular quote. It always takes more and more. Covetousness and greed. It was William Hendrickson in his commentary he quotes from W.A. Meyer, For Better, Not For Worse, a book written many, many years ago. 
But he said in the pocket of a rich man who had just committed suicide was found $30,000 and a letter which read in part, quote, I have discovered during my life that piles of money do not bring happiness. I'm taking my life because I can no longer stand the solitude and boredom. When I was an ordinary workman in New York, I was happy. Now that I possess millions, I am infinitely sad and prefer death. Covetousness and greed are not the answer. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. The writer to Hebrews is very direct at this point of discontentment, of covetousness, of greed. As Hebrews 13.5 says, Let your conduct be without covetousness, be content with such things as you have. Isn't it interesting? Two phrases put side by side. That's why I think they are opposites, direct opposites. Let your life, your conduct, your behavior be without covetousness without greed, the desire to have more and more and more. But be content with such things as you have. In an Our Daily Bread article written many years ago, Philip Parham tells the story of a rich industrialist who was disturbed to find a fisherman sitting lazily beside his boat. Why aren't you out there fishing, he asked. Because I've caught enough fish for today, said the fisherman. Why don't you catch more fish than you need? The rich man asked, what would I do with them? You could earn more money, came the impatient reply, and buy a better boat, you could go deeper, you could catch more fish. You could purchase nylon nets, you could catch even more fish and make more money. Soon, you'd have a fleet of boats and be rich like me. The fisherman asked, then what would I do? The industrialist said, you could sit down and enjoy life. The fisherman replied, what do you think I'm doing now? (laughs) Covetousness and greed too often are at the root of discontentment. But then you move on to something else, and that's comparison. And comparison is a definite trap that even believers fall into. We are constantly comparing what we have to what another has. Or we're comparing what we have now to what we used to have. It's the, it's the good old days syndrome. Is anybody ever affected by that? You know, we look back and say, the good old days. Some of us are old enough now to be able to see some old days, but they weren't always as good. And, and that's the problem. We like to look at the things that were good about those days, but what about the bad things about those days? You know, Exodus chapter 16, Israel has come across the Jordan, not the Jordan, excuse me, wrong wrong book, across the Red Sea. God has delivered them as Moses led them across. But in Exodus chapter 16, the amazing thing, and and I think this has struck you as well, when you read through the book of Exodus, you see one of the mightiest demonstrations of the power of God in Exodus chapter 14, as that body of water raises into two walls. And the Israelites go by on dry land. There are multitudes of miracles. There's there's more than one miracle that takes place there in the Exodus. And as they went across, imagine, and they see all that water come back down upon the Egyptians. You would say, how great is God, how mighty is God. There is nothing our God cannot do. Until we come to that point where we don't have any water, when we come to that place where we don't have anything to eat, or we don't have the thing that we want to eat, In Exodus chapter 16, just two chapters later, it says in verse 2 that the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. 
What was so good about Egypt? 430 years in Egypt, much of which was in slavery. People were crying to get out of that situation, but not now. Because you see, the Israelites were complaining because they were comparing what they were going through now in this trial with what they had. They used to have more back then, they thought. They said, oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the pots of meat, when we ate bread to the full. For you brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then you go over to Numbers chapter 11, and of course it doesn't stop. Exodus 15, they complained. Exodus 16, they complained. Exodus 17, they complained. Then you go over to Numbers chapter 11. Once again, they're looking at the way life used to be. They're comparing and saying, oh, that we could go back to the good old days. Numbers 11, it says the mixed multitude in verse 4, who were among them yielded to intense craving. So the children of Israel also wept again and said, who will give us meat to eat? You see, God had given them the manna. God had provided all that they needed, but they wanted meat now. We remember the fish which we ate freely in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our whole being is dried up. There's nothing at all except this manna before our eyes. You can almost hear their disgust and their discontentment. Look at what we used to have when we were in Egypt. We don't have that now. Has God neglected meeting your needs? Well, we've always had the manna. Then why are you complaining? Discontentment because of comparison. That leads to another form of discontentment, envy. That's a third root, often, of discontentment. Seeing what another has, desiring it for ourselves, and then wishing that he didn't have it. The psalmist talks about that in Psalm 37, when he tells us not to fret, not to become discontented, not to become irritated. He said, Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Asaph fell into that trap in Psalm 73 when he looked around and he saw the wicked who were prospering. And he describes in great detail how they were prospering. But he says about himself, I'm suffering. He even comes to the point of saying, I've washed my hands in vain. I've cleansed my heart. I've cleansed my hands. I've walked with God for nothing. Can you imagine coming out with that statement? And maybe we've said that too, when we've looked around and we've seen even those who are turning against God and how they seem to have God's blessing on them, but we look at our own lives and we say, they've got so much more than I have. You see, comparison once again, and envy. In other words, we're saying to God, God, you are not good. You are so much better for the wicked than you are for me. Or that other Christian who doesn't walk as faithfully with God as you think you do, and you say, hmm, he has it much better than I have it. Envy, flowing out of a comparison once again with others. And once again, at the root of this sin of discontentment. And then another one, another root is ingratitude. Not being thankful to God for what we have. In Psalm 106, Israel's history is reviewed. And so often, as we see, when Israel's history is reviewed, it's not a pretty picture. You see, they were very discontented with what God gave them or what they thought God didn't give them. In Psalm 106, verse 7, the psalmist says, Our fathers in Egypt did not understand your wonders. They did not remember the multitude of your mercies, but they rebelled by the sea, the Red Sea. 
Then you move on down to verses 13 and 14. They soon forgot his works. And I want you to see this idea of forgetfulness and not remembering. They soon forgot what God did. They did not wait for his counsel, but they lusted exceedingly in the wilderness, and they tested God in the desert. Once again, they said, all we can eat is this manna. We want meat. We want flesh. So God gave them their request and sent leanness and disease to their souls. Once again, discontentment. Verses 21 and 22, they forgot God their Savior, who had done great things in Egypt, wondrous works in the land of Ham. Once again, not remembering what God had done and not having that grateful heart. Verses 47 and 48, the psalmist closes the chapter by saying, Save us, O Lord our God, and gather us from among the Gentiles to give thanks to your holy name, to triumph in your praise. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting, and let all the people say, Amen. Praise the Lord. As you look at your life, if you see this sin of discontentment, what's at the root? Is it covetousness and greed? Is it comparing with others? Is it envy and jealousy? Is it ingratitude? But what's the result? Recognize the result of discontentment. And there are many results, but the one that I'm going to, to mention that I think afflicts so many of us is complaining. And I go back to Israel once again. And I'm not going to go back to Exodus 15, 16, and 17, but take some time later to look at those verses. It seems like the same song, second verse. Everything is a repeat. No water, discontentment, they complain. No food, or not the food that we want. God's doing a great job of supplying, but not what we want it to be. They complain. They do the same thing in Exodus 17. What do we do? We begin to express our discontentment and our dissatisfaction to the Lord and to others. And that's what they did. Don Kistler in an article called Table Talk said this, the person with the discontented heart has the attitude that everything he does for God is too much, and everything that God does for him is too little. We lose sight of who God is and what God wants to do in our lives. We lose sight of his sovereignty in placing us where we are, where he wants us to be, and in giving us what we need to have. It was David Osberger who said, an undisciplined adult is just a child who has grown old. He says, a man named Bob admitted that he was always trying to get circumstances and people to be the way he wanted them to be. But he was frustrated because he was fighting a losing battle. One day he woke up to the fact that his life contained many good things just as it was. When I think it through, he confessed, I realized I'm spoiled. Maybe one of the definitions of a spoiled person is not knowing when to be satisfied. Israel fit that mold, as we saw in Psalm 106. They were never satisfied with what God did. We as Christians can fall into that same trap as well. And we become complaining, we become bitter with God, we begin to doubt His goodness because God's not giving us exactly what we think He should be giving us. How do we remove discontentment. How do we truly deal with this? I want to give you some steps. In light of what we've seen so far, let's commit ourselves to the removal of discontentment. First of all, review your situation. Review your situation of discontentment. Ask yourself the question, is this a godly discontentment? Is this truly God trying to move me? Trust in the Lord for guidance. Pursue greater growth. We don't want to come to that place as Christians where we're complacent, where we're just sitting there. 
living as we always did, doing what we've always done, we want to move on to greater spiritual growth. So if it's godly discontentment, then pursue that greater growth. Follow God's leading. But if it's an ungodly discontentment like we've been looking at, and you can see any of those roots of covetousness and greed, of comparison, of envy, of ingratitude, then we need to confess that discontentment as sin, and we need to get to the root of the problem and say, Lord, I see in my life that I've been looking too much at what others have instead of what you've given me. I've been looking too much at what I used to have instead of what I, and comparing it to what I have now. Lord, I have an ungrateful spirit. Lord, I'm jealous. I'm not thankful for what you've given to that person. I'm very unhappy that you've given that person that because, Lord, I don't have it. We can sit back and we become very bitter and we can complain. Review your situation. Which is it? Is it God making you discontented, moving on, saying it's time to move on from here? Or is it the case that it's, it's selfishness? Second thing to do is revise your perspective. Revise your perspective. Many times we are discontented when we place our focus on temporal things rather than eternal things. 1 Timothy chapter 6, in that passage... It draws a direct contrast between that. The temporal, the eternal. 1 Timothy chapter 6. He contrasts godliness with materialism and always striving to get more and more. He said, gain is spiritual rather than material. It's godliness rather than wealth in verse 6. Godliness with contentment is great gain. He talks about material wealth in verse 7. He says, we brought nothing into this world. It's certain we can carry nothing out. Material wealth is only temporary. So if you have your eyes on always getting something that someone else has or always getting something much better than what God has already given you, then could it be that you're putting your focus and your eyes on that which is passing away? What are you going to take out of this world with you? Not your car, not your house, not your books even. We are laying treasure up in heaven. We've got people that we're pouring our lives into. We're making disciples. They're the ones who are going to be going on ahead, not the temporal things. Think about everything that you see physically right in front of you right now is going to pass away. These pews are going to rot away. That carpet's going to wear away. This building may not be standing. 50 years from now. Of course, the Lord may have come by then. Won't make any difference, right? But think about it. You're not taking anything out. There's a statement in the Jewish Talmud that says that man comes into the world with, with a clenched fist, but he goes out with an empty hand. H.A. Ironside used that illustration many years ago from the and he, he's, he said, we come in trying to grasp everything we can. Give me, give me, give me. But when we leave, we don't take any of it with us. Paul said, therefore, in light of all that, having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. And when he uses clothing here, it's not just the idea of the clothing, but it, it, it's actually a covering. So as, as many have pointed out, it's not just talking about the clothing, but the shelter we have. You know, what are the basic needs of man? They, they always told us is food, clothing, and shelter. They're all covered there. He says, if you've got that, then be content. We don't need to have the best of everything. 
But then he also gives us another perspective, changing it from the temporal to the eternal. Instead, he says, realize that wealth, seeking wealth, could hurt you spiritually. Because he says in verse 9, those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and snare, and many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. You see, it's going to have a spiritual effect on you. That when you're done with it, you're going to say, I wish I never would have pursued that route. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, from which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. The love of money can actually lead you away from the faith. And you know, we are living in a day in which you turn on the television or the radio and you will hear preacher after preacher after preacher who preach the prosperity gospel. That God wants everybody prosperous. Well, if that's the case, they don't throw in this warning. Warning, if you pursue this path, you could pierce yourself through with many sorrows. Many times that's not even pointed out. What's more, as Paul continues on, he says, instead, pursue that which is eternal. Verse 11, you, O man of God, flee from all these things of pursuing the wealth. And instead, pursue Chase after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. You see, revise your perspective. If your perspective right now is focused on the temporal things that are going to pass away, and that's where you've been pouring yourself, you're going to be very discontented in life. Instead, find your contentment in the Lord. Hebrews chapter 13, we read that verse earlier, and, and many times I think we disconnect Hebrews 13, 5. We always use the promise, I will never leave you nor forsake you, and that's a tremendous promise. But it's in the context here of being content and not being covetous. He said, let your conduct be without covetousness, be content with such things as you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? Once again, change your perspective. If your perspective has been covetous, become content by focusing on what you have in the Lord. You can be content because you have the Lord's presence, you have the Lord's protection, and you have the Lord's provision. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You've always got Him. And what's more, He's your helper. He's going to provide what you need, and He's also going to protect you. He said, I will not fear. What can man do to me? So once again, we need to revise our perspective. And it, when you are discontented, more than likely there is with it a perspective that is no longer eternal, but it's based on the temporal things of life. A third thing we need to realize from Philippians chapter 4 is recognize the process. Let me ask you a question. When a person trusts in Jesus Christ as their Savior, do they automatically become content? I think even Paul himself would disagree with that. I think he would tell us, no, they don't. Because Philippians chapter 4, think of all the things that Paul suffered. Read 2 Corinthians 11, the catalog, the list of things that he went through, the persecution that he suffered. And in Philippians chapter 4, he says in verse 11, not that I speak in regard to need. I'm not bringing up how you've provided for my needs uh, to get more or to tell you how needy I am. He said, I, because I've learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound everywhere and in all things. I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. He's looking over his ministry. He's looking over probably many, many years. And he's going back maybe to 
that list again of the things that he'd been through. He says, everywhere and in all things, in all of these circumstances, I've learned. You see, there is a process involved with contentment. Contentment must be learned. It doesn't come automatically. It is a learning process. Paul says, I have learned, I know how to be abased, and he says, I have learned both to be full and to hungry. He says it twice. I've learned. Through all the circumstances I've gone through, I've learned. What are some of the lessons we learn when we go through those times? The lesson of faith in Christ, dependence on His strength. That's why he says in verse 13, I can do all things, or I'm strong for all things through Christ who strengthens me. If you've been a believer for a while, you can look back and you can say, I can be content because I've seen what God can do when I trust Him. God can work this out. You learn the lesson of dependence on the body of Christ. In this context here, Paul had learned how he could depend also on Christians like the Philippian believers to come. As he says in verse 16, even in Thessalonica you sent once and again for my necessities. He learned the lesson of dependence on the body of Christ. We're in it together. God using his people to meet the needs of others. We can learn the lesson of patience and endurance through our testings and our trials, as James said. That we can count it all joy, knowing that testing produces endurance. And we know the lesson of gratitude as we go through, and we can see that God has worked it out, that God is sovereignly in control. We can go back with the psalmist in Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And we can look back and we can see how God has blessed us. So recognize the process. Contentment must be learned, as Paul says. But also, a fourth, rest in the Lord. Rest in the Lord. And right from that verse, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The key to attaining contentment is dependence on Christ. It's not just saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through this, I'm going to be content. No. It's got to be not in my st- willpower, not in my strength, but in the power of Christ. You know, many times I think this verse is torn out of its context. And I think it's misinterpreted in many ways. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, says the student who's never studied for the tests. I can do all things through Christ. I can go and I can lift up a car with my bare hands. We can can do all sorts of maneuvering with Philippians 4.13 in the context When he says, I can do all things, or I'm strong for all things. What's the all things? The all things in this context he's already talked about in verse 12. Everywhere and in all things, in all circumstances, in all situations. Therefore, no matter what that circumstance, no matter what that situation, I am strong to face all things through him who strengthens me. Rely on His sufficiency and His power to carry you through those circumstances. And then verse 19, My God shall supply all your need according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Trust in the Lord Jesus to supply every need. It's resting in His power and resting in His provision, knowing that He will meet that need. A fifth thing, respond with gratitude. Respond with gratitude. One thing we saw with the Israelites in Psalm 106, that they forgot what God had done. They were not grateful, and they went on into disobedience. A lack of contentment results so often from a lack 
of gratitude. Give thanks to the Lord for what He's done. You know, if there was anybody who could have looked at life and, and said, wow, I wish God hadn't have made me this way, it was Fanny Crosby. In fact, God didn't make her that way anyway. She became blind as a young child. And you look at that and you think, she lived over, uh, I think, about 95. She lived a long time blind. But there was a lady who did not complain a lady who had contentment. She wrote over 8,000 hymns. When she was only six weeks old, she developed a minor eye inflammation. The doctor's careless treatment left her blind. She could have been bitter toward that doctor, but she wasn't. She could have said, Lord, you, you deprived me of my sight. He didn't. And she wrote that first poem when she was eight years old. What? You know, this was not something she got later in life. This was something she must have had as a child. She said, oh, what a happy child I am, although I cannot see. I am resolved that in this world contented I will be. How many blessings I enjoy that other people don't. So weep or sigh because I'm blind. I cannot, nor I won't. What an attitude. There was a gratefulness on her part for what the Lord had done. She wasn't focusing on the problem. She wasn't focusing on the trial. She was focusing on the goodness of God to her. And if you're discontented right now, it's time to go back and look at the goodness of God to you. It's time to go back and express that gratitude from comparison. Refrain from comparison. Beware of envying others. Don't get your eyes on what others have. Comparison is a trap. Remember that your standard is not the performance or position of others that they have, but it's Christ. Keep your eyes focused on Him. You know, as, as we tie it together today, We get back to that idea, we're not happy with our circumstances, we're not happy with what we have. We become discontented, and we think the solution is just to change our circumstances. And many times as believers, we go through life and we think, I'll just move on to something different. But the happiness and the discontentment remains. That's because it's not a problem with the circumstance, it's a problem with the heart. As Dave Edgner, Radio Bible Class, said many years ago, what would it take to make you happy? Inheriting a fortune, winning $14 million in the lottery, and being able to purchase anything you wanted? A psychologist named Denier did a study on the effect that a major life change would have on a person's happiness. Half the people tested were big lottery winners. The other half suffered severe injuries and bad car accidents. To his amazement, Denier discovered that a few weeks after these drastic life changes, both groups were about equally happy and satisfied with their lives. Denier concluded that we, quote, evaluate our lives on the basis of other people in similar circumstances, unquote, and feel about the same degree of fulfillment. And you know, we, we come to the point where we think, if only I had a million dollars, then I'd, I'd really be content. If only I had good health like other people have, then I'd, then I'd be content. If only I had more people in my sphere of influence or more people to whom I could minister, then I'd truly be happy. Once again, not satisfied. Paul said, I've learned in whatever state I am, whatever circumstance I am, to be content. I like what Warren Wiersbe said, commenting on those verses. He said, it is not contentment arising from an abundance of things, but an inner adjustment to outer circumstances. See, God doesn't want you to just go around in life constantly trying to change your circumstances. He wants you to adjust in a biblical way, in a godly way, 
by becoming content where He has placed you. Once again, it's not a change in circumstances that's going to make you content. It's a change in the heart. Everything that we identified as the root of, of discontentment was a heart issue, not a circumstance issue. And everything that is needed to remove that discontentment pertains to the heart. Without a heart change, there can be no contentment. Remember, true contentment is not dependent on circumstances. True contentment is learned by experience. True contentment is found in Christ alone and His eternal riches. And remember, true contentment is possible only through Christ's empowering. Father, we pray today that you would help us to learn this lesson of contentment. Father, we know that discontentment is so easy to slip into our lives. Help us to remove those roots today. Help us to truly become content, not by trying to change our circumstances, by adjusting in a godly way to our circumstances, by not comparing, by not envying, by not coveting, by not being ungrateful and complaining. Help us, Father, to apply what we've seen today. And I pray for any today who have never trusted in Jesus Christ as their Savior. Father, we know today that they cannot truly have full contentment in their lives without that relationship with the Lord Jesus. The things of this world, the people of this world, all that this world offers cannot bring lasting satisfaction. We pray today, Father, for any who have never trusted in Christ, who are here today or watching on the live stream. We pray today, Father, that you would help them to realize that the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross to save them from sin. He rose again that they cannot be forgiven of their sin and have eternal life by any good works, works that they do. By any performance, by living a good life, by coming to church, by reading the Bible, these things will not save us. It's only by trusting in the work that Jesus Christ did on the cross that they can be saved. We pray today that they would find that joy and they would find that contentment in Christ alone. Help us as believers to realize that that's where our contentment is found as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning, we're going to turn to hymn number 317 as we talk about that wonderful peace that is brought. And when I think of contentment, I certainly think of that peace that, that Christ offers us. That even in the midst of our suffering and even in the midst of bad circumstances. Today, let's stand and let's sing this, this old hymn, hymn number 317. Let's sing the first three verses. Wonderful peace, number 317.
coming down from the Father above. Sweep over my spirit forever, I pray. In fathomless billows of love, I am resting today in this wonderful peace. Resting sweetly in Jesus' control. For I'm kept from all danger by night and by day. And His glory is flooding my soul. Peace, peace, wonderful peace. Coming down from the Father above, sweep over my spirit forever, I pray, in fathomless billows of love. We can be dismissed this morning thanking God for His blessing. Let's sing together the doxology. Praise God. Church, or hope, well, you can see the title of the 